Okay, I will try. I will try to be uh, quicker than my previous uh, colleagues. So let's start with some general introduction. Um, because many things have been already um, said today, you no, know, on, on, on by particularly by David, you no, know, on plant water uh, relations or relationships. So in my case, what I wanted to do more is to focus afterwards in in some. Uh, biotechnological uh, tools or approaches to to improve plant tolerance to drought what has been done so far not not at the epigenetic level but uh, um, uh, using uh, molecular and and, and, and genetic uh, uh, tools to to modulate ABA signaling and some of the of the studies that I'm going to to show today, they have been performed in our lab and, uh, and others, uh, some collaborators too. And I think it's interesting to see how is the the uh, state of the art so far and and what could be done no, in the in the future in the framework of this project. Can you hear me? Well, so is it fine? Okay. So, well, this is a kind of a general introduction on how plants uh, behave no, under uh, drought stress conditions. So, um, well, uh, you know that the, the water uh, availability is uh, key you know, for, for plants to, to grow, to, to reproduce, and, and that it's, a, it's going to be a limiting factor in many, in many areas in the, in the world. So here, you can see uh, with this triangle what are the critical or limiting um, uh, traits that affect uh, plant development, and in uh, important areas of the of the world is going to be temperature. In some others, like the jungles or, or the Amazonia, for example, is going to be sunlight. No, the competition for sun, but in 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 uh, very large areas in the world is going to be uh, water uh, availability. So particularly you can see in, in Australia or most of, of Africa and very, very, very large areas in, in, in the Americas. So, and also very importantly in, into, into the Mediterranean basin. And uh, this uh, water uh, uh, limitation is going to affect, uh, of course, growth of plants and photosynthesis. So which in the end, limits the yield of, of crops, you know, which is the, the interacting, interesting aspect you know, for, for uh, agrotechnologists. And uh, this is a, the current uh, situation, but the predictions are, are not good either. So uh, you can see here this uh, sensitivity to desertification in the Mediterranean basin. And this is what is this is from 2008. So I guess right now it's, it's much worse. So as you can see here, many countries in, in Europe, you know, in, in the south of Europe, are very sensitive to, to this desertification, and the, the, it will have a, a huge impact you know, under a, a climate change scenario. Particularly Spain, you can see here that we are kind of very, very uh, worried about the, the future, you no, know, uh, because in all these areas there is a huge production of uh, crops in, in, in that actually will feed in most of Europe. So um, the, the, the strategies that plants uh, undertake to, to survive or to cope with a, a limitation of in water no, or drought are pretty different. So depending on the, on the, on the plant species, particularly uh, many, many plants have evolved um, uh, desiccation tolerance, no, like uh, bryophytes, particularly mosses, but also there are some vascular plants like Selaginella, which are called the resurrection plants, no, that they are they are pretty pretty tolerant to 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 desiccation, and they can be rehydrated afterwards, and they will survive perfectly. And uh, this happens at the whole plant level, but also uh, in vascular plants happens. Uh, in particular organs or um, structures, you know, like a pollen or, or seeds, they are, they are strongly tolerant to, to desiccation and that's a, a way to survive and to, to a low reproduction of, of plants. And um, actually, as I said, so this uh, desiccation tolerance is, um, 
evolved when plants uh, colonize land, particularly in liverworts, mosses, but it also happens in, in some vascular plants um, species, and it appeared at several times in, in evolution, no? in, uh, at different times. So the, the point is that most vascular plants evolve different strategies to, to cope with this uh, water limitation. Uh, in the case of uh, of, of plants that uh, resurrection plants or so on, where about 80 or 90 percent of the water is lost, so the, um, the cells acquire a quiescent a state in which uh, they lose the water, but they uh, accumulate uh, different compounds and proteins at their cell wall and membranes that allow folding of those structures to avoid uh, cell damage. And also at different uh, organelles, not like plastids or, or mitochondria. So to, to, to um, uh, keep no, their structures. And um, they also will uh, accumulate different osmoprotectants, or antioxidants and uh, uh, solutes that uh, allow vitrification of the cytosol. So in this way, the cell remain quiescent, waiting for, for water. Um, so uh, this is what I said. So this vitrification of cytoplasmic, you know, the cytoplasm is going to allow survival of the plant and this accumulation of, of uh, photopigments that uh, act against uh, redox or, or uh, reactive uh, oxygen species. And um, what I wanted to go, because I wanted to go fast here, is the, um, that there are going to be different plant, I mean, responses. Some of them happen under moderate water deficit and some other under severe. So there are different regulatory mechanisms that are going to allow this first, let's say, um, responses on the accumulation of osmolites and, and uh, late embryonic proteins and dehydrins and so on, and disorders that are going to be more severe. And uh, the strategies, as I said, are different depending on the on the on the uh, plant species. Some are desiccation tolerant, but others are desiccation sensitive, mostly vascular plants. Within the uh, desiccation sensitive species, we have the serophytes that are usually the the, the plants that. Uh, uh, belong to the Crassulaceae or Cacaceae species, which are, have evolved strategies for, for accumulation of water in different tissues or, or organs. And uh, those are the succulents. And then we have the, what is called the mesophytes, which is most of the, of the uh, crops, no? with uh, plant species with an agronomic uh, interest. And uh, for those, there are also plants that are trough tolerant and trough sensitive. So in the in the frame of, of epicillin, we will try to, to learn about uh, traits or epi traits that underlie that tolerance to, to drought, uh, even within the same uh, plant species, in this case, oil seed rape. And as you could see in the in the in the seminar by uh, Manolo, um, so we can observe pretty big differences even within the same uh, plant species like uh, Brassicanapus, no? for in the case of, of uh, thermomorphogenesis. And it is, it is expected that something very similar will happen in the case of, of drop tolerance. So uh, in the case of the, of the plant species, but particularly in the mesophytes, the water deficit is going to be sensed according to, to the amount of, of water that is available. No? And this, is, this depends on the influx and efflux of, of water. Plants are going to lose water through uh, transpiration and, uh, and they are going to acquire from soil. No? And uh, if this uh, uh, ratio of uh, water influx against uh, water efflux is, is negative, so it, uh, we are going to have a, a trough stress response. This water trough stre stress response is pretty complex. And um, one important question around here is that there is not a master regulator or a, a master sensor as a, it, um, it could be found for other signaling pathways. So you could see in the case of, a, of a 
tolerance to to high temperature, as shown by by Manolo, that there are many different mechanisms. In plants, it is expected that there are going to be also different mechanisms to sense uh, the the lack of water or uh, water deprivation, such as, for example, uh, cell turgor pressure. So it's expected that the 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 turgor of the cells is going to be sensed by different ion channels or protein components in the in the membranes, and, and this is going to trigger. Uh, I mean, uh, if, the, if the water availability, availability drops, is going to be sensed, no, by 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 a loss of turgor, and um, it could be also uh, proteins at the at the cytoplasm that would be able to to perceive uh, the higher or lower concentrations of, of osmolites, and uh, so, but the, the identity of those of those potential sensors of, of water availability is not known. And uh, upon um, triggering of this uh, drop stress uh, signaling, there is going to be a cascade of uh, signaling events. Some of them depends on ABA on abscisic acid, and, but some others not. And in the end, it will trigger uh, the activation or repression of different transcription factors at the nucleus that will trigger you know, uh, a specific uh, transcriptomic programs that indeed uh, help the plant to cope with with drought, but uh, as is, I mean, many of those components are are not known. It looks really really complex, and um, the idea is that the um, in order to to um, provide approaches for or to improve uh, tolerance of plants to to drought, a kind of a, a I would say that so we would need to modulate many many responses at the same time you know, in a systemic way. So it's not going to be a very linear way to to control to modulate uh, plant adaptation to to drop stress by controlling one of these transcription factors. The idea would be to control the overall pathways. And um, this is this would be at the level of uh, the control of uh, transcriptomic responses, but there are other physiological responses that are key to control uh, um, water. Uh, I mean, water stress responses. One of them is the control of the closure of the stomata. You know, stomata are are present in all land plants, but not in, in liverworts, and not in Marcantia, for example. But in most you know, most species of, of moses, they have. Uh, Stomata, these pteridophytes and genospers and angiospers. So, and um, the closure of the stomata is going to be responsive to, to water availability, to the water potential in, in the cell, uh, in also in neighbor cells. And uh, also, it, it will depend on the water potential that is sensed uh, at the root. But particularly the stomata, you know that they are small pores that are present in the in the epidermal, as um, in the epidermis of, of of leaves. So they are going to to I mean they, they are going to avoid the loss of of, of water under of the stress conditions. But at the same time, um, they I mean they need to be kept uh, open for for. Um, uh, CO2 assimilation and photosynthesis. So there must be a balance between the closure of the stomata and the trough conditions, but also of, of CO2 assimilation to a low growth of, of, of plants, no? to, to a low photosynthesis and growth of plants. And um, this closure of the stomata is going to be very uh, responsive to, to the presence of ABA, thus under trough uh, conditions. Uh, ABA synthesize accumulates in the stomata. The stomata uh, vacuole is going to to lose uh, turgor, and uh, we, we get this uh, closure of the stomata to avoid loss of water. And uh, another uh, primary response, as uh, David uh, uh, mentioned in his talk this morning, it's um, and that, which is also going to be mediated by by ABA. Is a, a, a difference in the in the growth of different organs. No, uh, in this case, a drop is going to trigger the 
the the development or the growth of the of the sorry trough it's going to trigger the 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 growth of the root primarily and uh however at the same time there is going to be a reduction uh, of the shoot uh, growth and this can be uh, seen here in this um, in this wheat uh, field in which uh, the right side of the field has water with 40 percent of water compared to the one on the, on the left and you can see the huge the, the, the very significant reduction in growth just by reducing by 40 percent the, the, these plants have been watered but you can see how how the growth is reduced and particularly the yield no? and uh about yield so this is pretty pretty significant for cereals so during the filling of the grain so troughs can can really really have a, a, a huge impact you can see this this uh, core in, in which um they, they they have suffered uh trough at, very, at the very wrong time no during the the filling of the grains and you can see that this this is a disaster no for for the farmers and also the same happens with wheat you can see the the the, the size of the of the grains and so on so um so in the case of of plants therefore there is much there must be a balance between uh the survival of the plants and their trough stress conditions and the and the trough and it will depend on the severity and the duration of this uh, of the trough no of the of the water deprivation so under very very severe uh, trough conditions the stomata are going to closure to to avoid losing water is the, the the growth is going uh, of the shoot is going to be limited and um and the 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 carbon and energy resources are going to be um uh, move for to biosynthesis of protective compounds. However, under suboptimal conditions, so that they are not going to affect the real survival of the plant. So there is a reprogramming of, of the uh, metabolins, uh, osmotic adjustments, and also maintenance of the cell wall flexibility, so that the plant keeps being competitive and can, I mean, can complete the, the life cycle. So this would be overall all the all the responses that occur in the in the plant during the during stress conditions, trough stress conditions. So there is a, an important growth in the in the root, stomatal closure. Uh, there is a reduction in the photosynthesis and the growth of the of the shoot, and there is going to be an accumulation of uh, of solutes you know, to to uh, allow uh, cell viability. So as you can see, is this is a very very complex response at the overall uh, plant, and uh, it's going to require a very very sophisticated uh, regulatory system to coordinate all these responses at the same time. And this means that there are many traits that could be uh, targeted you know, to to improve um, uh, plant uh, tolerance to to drought. Um, hopefully, in in affect i mean trying to, to to target many as many as of those as possible so um in general at the agricultural level so there are three uh, kind of um approaches or um technologies that uh, can be implemented to improve uh, the the performance of, of crops under trophies uh, stress conditions. One of them is to prevent, you know, to to monitor how is the water availability in the field, you know. And there, you know, that there are many different uh, ways. And and nowadays they are really, really sophisticated, like the use of drones and uh, armed with different cameras, uh, infrared cameras that allow um, scanning and and quantification of the water availability right in the field and to, to water them precisely, you know, depending on the on the on the uh, water requirements of uh, different uh, uh, fields or areas in the field. Another one is to diagnose, to, to, to precisely uh, monitorize uh, the stress responses in plants, for example, um, quantifying um, uh, uh, photosynthesis uh, indexes or um, uh, water availability or water potential, so not right in the, in the crops, no? in the, right in the fields. And the, the other approach is to improve the tolerance of, of plants. So for this, you know, and, and particularly uh, uh, now that we have uh, those plant uh, breeding 
uh, uh, training courses so that the, there are different genetic strategies that are aimed to, to improve different traits, but particularly uh, drought tolerance in, in crops. Uh, usually those breeding, I know go, I'm not the breeder, so I, I'm just going to sh show you uh, these uh, generalities that there are two different approaches. Uh, one of them is the classical one, is to follow a forward genetics approach to uh, select uh, varieties or lines based on the phenotype, those that uh, behave better under trough stress conditions and to try to, to, to select those and to, and to uh, inbreed them with uh, other interesting uh, lines uh, to the, in the end get you know, this, this uh, interesting uh, phenotype in, in, the, in the final uh, crop that is going to be uh, served. The other one, the other approach is the reverse genetics. So it's the, the one that you try to identify what genes are uh, involved in drought tolerance. For example, looking for genes that uh, respond to, to drought and to check whether they can uh, improve uh, the tolerance of plants to, to water limitation by uh, altering their levels in, in those uh, varieties. So uh, then that is, um, this is one step further, which is but is also based on, on, on reverse genetics, and it's, it's in which we try to, to modify its um, it's the um, reprogramming of plants under drought stress conditions, and this is based in the control of ABS signaling. And I will show you now some examples on how, by controlling ABA perception and signaling, we can reprogram different responses. Of, of plants, and particularly, well, this has been done in, 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 in model plants, particularly in Arabidopsis. And, um, and, and well, well, some examples, I mean, uh, correspond to studies performing in our laboratory. And as, uh, the very first one has been done by, by, by Pedro Rodriguez in, in, in Valencia. And uh, in which they aim to modulate the perception of ABA. So in this case, all these approaches try to tackle or try to, to modulate ABA perception to control or to reprogram or uh, ABA signaling perception and, and responsive genes to improve plant tolerance to drought. The first, um, so they are all based on this. This is a snapshot, which is actually pretty nice. It was a, a number of years ago in which they summarize uh, many of the of the aspects on ABA synthesis and uh, catabolism, also uh, transport, uh, control of uh, stomata closure or root growth, and um, how it is perceived, and what are the mechanisms that control the different uh, the turnover of the different components of the ABA perception and signaling pathway. So. As uh, David said, um, there are 14 members of the of the peer -peer family of ABA receptors in Arabidopsis, a similar number of, of, of these in, in monocots, for example, in rice, and they are going to perceive mainly abscisic acid. Also, it has also it has also been shown that some of them could also recognize and perceive facic acid, which is a, a degradative product of, of the catabolism of uh, abscisic acid. But the, the say that the physiological uh, phytohormone is a uh, abscisic acid. And um, there is uh, therefore uh, some redundancy, functional redundancy between them. Uh, but um, different studies have shown that there are specificities on the function of, of, of some of them. Particularly P8 looks to play a major role in Arabidopsis while perceiving ABA and triggering ABA responses. So, um, this I will just uh, um, pass because this has been shown by, by David, just to, to indicate that in the presence of ABA, ABA is going to be recognized by the peer pill uh, ABA. I mean, sorry, in the, in the absence of ABA, uh, the senior kinases are, are active and they are going to trigger um, phosphorylation of downstream targets like uh, transcase of factors, ABA5 was mentioned this morning, but also ion channels and so on. But in the, in the, um, um, sorry, this would be, sorry, is this would be, this I think is change. Okay. 
So in the presence of, of AVA, sorry, so in the presence of AVA, the BP AVA receptors are going to, to perceive the hormone. They are going to bind this, the, the molecule of, our, uh, of AVA and are going to inactivate the PP2C phosphatase. So in the end, what we get is, as I said, the SNR kinases are going to be autophosphorylated and active to trigger phosphorylation of, of different AVA um, uh, response to artificial factors, ion channels, and so on. Okay. Sorry. Uh, um, one of the strategies that have been undertaken by, by the group of, of Pedro Rodriguez, uh, it was to overexpress um, uh, the AV receptors to, in, to improve, to enhance the perception of the hormones and to trigger uh, enhanced responses to this hormone no, that could trigger uh, uh, drug tolerance. And this is the case of, um, of uh, overexpression of uh, one of the AV receptors, uh, which is PIL4. In this case, what they did is to, to engineer uh, PIL4 by mutating uh, an aniline uh, 194 for a threonine. And with this mutation, what they got is uh, an active AV receptor independent of the presence of AVA. So this is constitutively active and is going to be repressing the activity of the phosphatases. So they overexpress this in, in, in barley or wheat. And they, what they could observe is. Uh, it's plants that are more tolerant to drought. You can see here, this, this is the plant that has been stressed, and this is a wild type plant, and the wild type plant is dead, and the other one is going to survive. And the same happens in, in wheat, okay? So you can see these plants that are overexpressing that are much better than the wild type. I mean, they are not in the optimal condition, but for sure, after rehydration, these are going to survive compared to the wild type. Another strategy that the... Uh, uh, that the laboratory of Pedro Rodriguez um, uh, undertook so was to to um, to engineer uh, AVA receptors to recognize AVA agonists uh, in a very specific manner and in a very active manner. And this is because I mean one of the obvious strategies would be okay. So if, if there is going to I mean if we monitorize the, the, the field and we uh, learn uh, uh, according to the weather forecast that is going to be a, you know a lack of rain or drought for a few days or a long period. So we could try to to spray ABA to the fields, no, and and in, in that way enhance the response of of the crop. Uh, to to the drought tolerance. The problem is that the ABA is is uh, is larvae, so it's going to be degraded in quickly uh, upon exposure to UV light. So it's it's not a very stable molecule. So it's it's not uh, useful to spray ABA. So uh, what these people did, so the, the group of Pedro and others, for example, the group of some Cutler. Um, uh, UC Davis. So what they did is to to try to generate or create uh, ABA uh, agonists. So molecules that are similar to to ABA in in the fact that they can uh, activate ABA receptors and trigger the the ABA responses. And uh, they came out with uh, by different. Uh, uh, chemical genetic screens with different molecules that were able to trigger the ABA uh, responses, no? the ABA perception and responses. And this is what you can see here in these uh, infrared uh, images, so that different compounds. So this is a, and they're, so here we, 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 they are measuring say, foliar temperature. No? This is under, under normal conditions. So these plants, are have been treated, treated with a with a mock compound, and uh, they have a normal temperature, twenty degrees. But if they spray them with ABA, what you get here is closure. The ABA is going to trigger closure of the stomata, so that there is no transpiration, and there is heat accumulation. And this is what you see with this yellow color. That these plants are half the tomatoes are closed, and they are losing less water. And there are some other uh, compounds that, that really, really strongly close the stomatas, like, like the opabactin here. You can see the plants are red. So, so these plants have really, really close the stomata. They, the leaves are, are heating, but they are not losing the, the water. No? And this is going to enhance survival of the plant under trough conditions. So they went to one step, uh, one step further 
And what they did is to to really engineer not just a you know, not just to use uh, ABA agonists, but also to engineer the ABA receptors in a way that do, they could recognize not ABA but just the ABA agonist to make it really specific for the ABA agonist. And what they did is to look for uh, in different uh, plant species for the homologs of, of some of these ABA receptors. This is the case of P1. They, uh, the, the structure of this AB receptor has been solved. The, the protein was crystallized and the structure is known. And they know the, the, uh, the amino acids that mediate the interaction with the with ABA, you know, in the ABA recognition pocket. So what they did is to mutate all these uh, amino acids for some others in a way that the, this uh, engineer uh, PIL-1 receptor was unable to, to, to bind and recognize ABA. So uh, in this way, so by gene editing, they got uh, uh, ABA signaling off you know, by when, when using this uh, ABA receptor with the, with the five mutations. But they engineered these ABA receptors in a way that they could recognize the the still the ABA agonist to make it specific. So when, when this specific agonist is added to the media or spray to, to the plant, it's going to be recognized by the engineer P1 receptor. And uh, this will trigger recognition of the PP2C phosphatases to inhibit the, the phosphatase acti activity and to trigger the whole ABA signaling pathway. So, um, so, Okay, so uh, in that way, so well, actually, uh, the 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 um, the the difference between this uh, compound I was talking about, the, this uh, sulfobactin, is a modify or improve sulf sulfobactin, uh, is that it's able to uh, um, uh, it's going to be recognized or it's going to be mediate an interaction with a specific lysine. Uh, that other agonists are not going to, to interact with this lysine 88. So we have a strong interaction and specific recogn recognition of this molecule by the engineer P1 receptor. So in the end, what you get is plants that respond very, very strongly to the chemical and that they can tolerate drop very, very nicely. So as you can see here, when we add the compound uh, to, to plants, so they are going to survive you know, and plants that express this engineer uh, P1 receptor, they are going to, to, to tolerate very well draft upon 20 days of water deprivation. And after rehydration or watering, you can see there that they grow pretty fast and, and they are going to recover and to, to produce. So this is a very, very uh, useful tool in which we could manipulate the response of plants to, to draft uh, at our will by controlling, yeah, by, by, by using this, this specific ABA analyst. In other approaches, I'm going to show you a couple of examples, um, depend on, on the control of the stability of different components of the, of the ABA signaling pathway, particularly on the, on the stability and function of ABA receptors. And this is also part of that, the snapshot in which I was, I, I mentioned before, uh, in which uh, they depict different uh, mechanisms to control the stability of, um, of different components of the ABA signaling pathway by ubiquitination and degradation through the proteasome, but also through the uh, endosomal and multivesicular pathway for degradation at the vacuole. And I will show you one example of each of these that we have uh, of approaches based on this targeted degradation of ABA receptors through these two different pathways that we have undertook in, in our laboratory. The first one is based on this protein that you can see here, DDA1, uh, which is going to mediate the degradation of specific AB receptors. So what is this DDA1? So, well, um, you may know that we are a laboratory uh, with a background on uh, the study of plant proteostasis, uh, different uh, environmental responses like signaling, but also so I said, so some environmental stresses such as drought. No? So we have been studying the, the role of different uh, E3 ubiquitin legacies in the control of, of these responses. This, um, particularly, this is the case of uh, calium-4-based E3 ubiquitin legacies. These are called 
Kalin 4 based because the scaffold protein is a, is a Kalin. So these are all conserved in, in eukaryotes. So all the components here are conserved in, in eukaryotes and they mediate similar responses like DNA damage response or circadian clock responses. But in the case of plants, for sure, I mean, of course, they they control specific uh, plant uh, developmental programs or stress responses, you know, for example, such as the one of, of, of ABA. And, um, and what they do is to integrate different uh, environmental stress responses to, to trigger the ubiquitination of specific targets and in the end to control the function by controlling the function of those targets, for example, different transcription factors or so on. So they, they, they can um, trigger transcriptomic uh, responses and also physiological responses and uh, that end up in coordinated adaptive responses to different stresses and environmental systems. The DA1 here, you can see, is part of the substrate adapter module. It's this part around here is the one that is going to recognize the target that needs to be ubiquitinated and, and degraded. And um, actually, so the structure of uh, DDA1 in complex with the, with the DDB1 substrate module has been solved, at least in part. And what has been proposed is that this DDA1, which is a tiny protein, actually 16 kilodaltons, is going to allow or facilitate recognition of the substrates and also to modulate the topology of the complex to uh, get the substrate close to this end of the, of the complex where the ubiquitination activity is going to be mediated. So in the end, DDA1 is going to facilitate recognition but also ubiquitination of the substrate you know, by interacting with different domains within the DDB1 protein. So we, uh, as part of our studies, uh, aim to identify what could be the uh, targets of DDA1 or the ones that DDA1 mediate recognition and what could be the regulators of, of DDA1 activity. And for that, we, we perform a used to have a screen using an Arabidopsis library and as a bait, we have Arabidopsis DDA1. So DDA1 says that it's conserved in eukaryote. They have pretty similar uh, features, and uh, but we use the one in Arabidopsis to identify different products. So different uh, 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 factors came out. Some of them are involved in chromatin remodeling. I will not talk about this, but I will talk about these two others because they were members of the PRP family of heavy receptors, such as PIL4 and PIL9. We confirm the interaction of uh, of uh, several I mean several peer peer receptors with DDA1 in vivo, and um, you can see here that the interaction uh, occurs in the nuclei. So these are uh, bimolecular fluorescent complementation assays. So we fuse uh, each of the proteins to be tested to a half of the YFP, of the yellow fluorescent protein. And if the two proteins interact, we get a reconstitution of the yellow fluorescent protein, and we can observe it at the confocal microscope. So you can see here, these are nuclei because they are stained with the, with the, the dirty stain for, for nucleic acids. And uh, yeah, this interaction occurring in, in nuclei, which is actually uh, the, let me show you, the cartoon is wrong. So the interaction that they show here is wrong. So it actually happens here in the nucleus. And, um, and this, uh, what we observe is that the overexpression of the, our DD1 protein is going to enhance or facilitate the degradation of pilate. And this is what you have here. So upon 60 minutes uh, in the presence of cyclohexamide, which is a protein synthesis inhibitor, uh, we get a stronger degradation in our DDA1 overexpression lines compared to the uh, wild type lines expressing just P8. Okay, and this is going going to this is a very interesting fact. This this is going to be counteracted by ABA. In the presence of ABA, DDA1 is not so active. So we came out to this uh, model in which. DDA1 facilitates recognition of P8 of the ABR receptor and is going to promote ubiquitination and degradation of the ABR receptor. And this somehow is, is uh, inhibited by ABA by uh, mechanisms that we don't understand well uh, at this point, but uh, we are studying. So, what means? So, it means, I mean, this, this degradation of P8 trigger 
by, by DDA1 means that DDA1 has a negative role in controlling ABA perception. And this is what you can see here. So plants that overexpress DDA1 are more tolerant to, to ABA. Okay, so they grow better in the presence of ABA compared to the wild type because they are they are repressors of ABA signaling. And also at the root level, you can see also that our plants grow better in the presence of ABA compared to the wild type. This also happens to some, I, I, I'm not showing it here, but it also happens to stresses that are mediated by ABA, such as a trough or osmotic stress. So we are now, uh, we, we patented this a number of years ago because this is a nice strategy to modulate the tolerance of plant to, to stress. So in the case of Pedro, uh, Pedro's work, what they try to do is to enhance the response of uh, ABA no, under severe stress conditions. But here, what we want to, 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 to generate is plants that overexpress DDA1 to make them partially blind to the stress. And this is important under suboptimal water uh, availability conditions, in conditions that are not going to, to compromise plant survival. So uh, in those conditions, we want plants that are able to keep growing, even they have some limitation in water availability, and that they can, can keep producing uh, um, fruits or grain, uh, even though uh, the uh, water availability is not up as optimal as they would like. No? And we are now producing plants in rice in collaboration with the group of uh, Sui Yong Li in, in China. And we expect to perform um, uh, field trials uh, soon with plants that overexpress uh, DD1, both from Arabidopsis, but also from rice. The other approach that I will mention uh, today is, uh, is based on the other mechanisms to control the stability of a uh, of AV receptors and uh, involves uh, vesicle trafficking. So there are specific AV receptors that are not, I mean, AV receptors can be found in the, in the nuclei, but also in the cytoplasms. And in the cytoplasms, they can be also associated to, to membranes. They don't have um, hydrophobic regions that act as transmembrane domains. So what they do is to interact with other proteins that are, have the, the ability, the ability to, to interact with membranes, for example, these calcium binding proteins. And in this way, they can associate to, 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 to the membranes to trigger ABA signaling in close proximity to, to the plasma membrane, for example, to regulate the activity of ion channels no? that control uh, cell turbo pressure and so on. So, um, so in these conditions, they will be able to control all the signaling pathway uh, uh, in close proximity to, 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 the, to the plasma membrane. The point is that at some point it's necessary to, to desensitize the AVA signaling pathway. And this is going to be mediated by this E3 ubiquity legacy that is also associated to the membrane, which is uh, RSL1. This one is going to polyubiquitinate uh, the AVA receptors that are associated to the membrane to trigger their internalization through the early endosomal pathway that after maturation are going to become multivesicular bodies. And these proteins are internalized within the multivesicular bodies to finally fuse to the vacuole to be released in the lumen of the vacuole for uh, degradation no? By, at, the, at the lytic vacuole. So this internalization of uh, cargo proteins at the multivesicular bodies involve, involve sorry, what is called the SCORT complexes, the endosomal complexes required for transport. And this is a, a, a well, this, this uh, involves a number of different protein complexes, SCORT 0, 1, 2, 3, and additional proteins that uh, sequentially uh, are going to, to transfer the cargo proteins from one to each other. And um, uh, these will be uh, afterwards, the ubiquitin in this cargo protein is going to be removed by this ubiquitinase here, and uh, they are going to be internalized by invagination of interluminal vesicles here into the lumen of the multivesicular bodies, which are the ones that fuse to the back. All this process is, uh, is facilitated by a protein which is called ALEX, also conserved in other eukaryotes. This ALEX protein has different domains and works somehow as a bridge. Uh, bringing different activities together, no? 
these score complexes and also the DBK kinases. And it's key to uh, a low internalization of the cargo proteins into the multivesicular body. So we have been characterizing alids in, in plants, and um, we came out with a mutant which is viable. Usually, null mutations in, in alix are lethal, in very lethal in the case of, of plants. No? These are two different mutant alleles, null mutant alleles in Arabidopsis. You can see it here. This is a, a vital stain, a tetrasolium chloride. So here is a viable embryo, which is a stain in red. If you boil the embryo, the embryo becomes white after staining. And this is what happens under normal conditions with the null mutant embryos. But we got a point mutation in, in the alix, uh, in a, a line that contains a point mutation, which is a, a change in the in one amino acid at the bro one domain, a globular domain in the end terminus of the protein. And these plants are viable. They are dwarf, but they are viable and fertile. So we can work with them and we can characterize the function of alix in these plants. And uh, one of the, you see here our mutation in the bro one domain, this point mutation here. There are two different colloquial domains and uh, a protein rich region. Each of them allows interaction with different protein complexes. So, what we found is that our protein mutation was affecting the trafficking of, of different cargo proteins. We checked, for example, one phosphate transporter, which is um, under uh, optimal uh, phosphate uh, availability conditions, is going to be internalized and degrade in the vacuole. So, but what happens? Uh, uh, the vacuole here is, is 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 filling most of the of the cell, so and uh, this protein is, is degraded. So you cannot see the fluorescence of this fusion of, of the phosphate transporter to GFP. What happens in the Alex mutant is that the protein cannot be internalized uh, into the multi multivesicular bodies and is not going to be released into the lumen of the of the vacuole. So it ends up in the tonoplast, in the membrane of the vacuole. So it's decorating here the tonoplast, is what you can see here. So there is a problem in the trafficking and degradation of uh, different cargo proteins in the alix beta. So interestingly, we found that the, the uh, different ABR re receptors were also interacting with alix. So it's, this is what you can see here in these two hybrid assays. And also, in, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, BAFC, by molecular for a single implementation assays here, you can see that PIL4 and ALEX interact. There is reconstitution of the fluorescence as specific vesicles. And these specific vesicles are multivesicular bodies because we have a, a marker for those multivesicular bodies here uh, fused to cherry and cherry. The color is red. And uh, there is an overlap between the two signals, is what you can see here in all these arrows. So this uh, allows us to identify uh, what kind of compartment is the one that. Uh, in, is the one in which PIL4, for example, or Alex are interacting. So uh, according to this potential role of Alex in the control of uh, trafficking and degradation of AB receptors, we found that Alex mutants were hypersensitive to ABA. So here you can see the presence of ABA, our plants are tiny and they have very, very small roots. This also happens in seedling establishments, seed germination, and it will not provide many details, but you can see the plants are much more smaller than the wild type or the complemented line. And uh, at the level of uh, stomata, it can be observed also a role for, for, for Alex. So our plants here are infrared imaging, images uh, that show uh, um, foliar uh, temperature. And as you can see here, this is the, the Columbia wild type. This is a mutant that has constitutively open stomata, so they are pretty cool. And uh, here we have our Alex mutants, and they have very close stomata, and the, the foliar temperature is higher. So we measure the aperture of the stomata by using the microscope. And as you can see here, uh, they are pretty closed compared to the to the controls, to the wild type and the complemented line. And uh, okay, and they are pretty sensitive to ABA. So uh, we added different concentrations of ABA, and just by adding 10 nanomolar ABA, there is a, a very significant closure of stomata in our mutants compared to the control or the complemented line. So our this, the, the word cells, no, that the one, the cells that conform the, the stomata are very sensitive to, to ABA. 
and they close quickly in the presence of this of this hormone. So what is happening within the, in the Alex Mietan? The problem with the Alex Mietan is there is no internalization of the AV receptor within the multivesicular body. This is the wild type, and you can see normal conditions. The, the AV receptor P4 fused to GFP is inside the multivesicular body, and in the Alex mutant, it's outside, cannot be internalized into, into the intraluminal vesicles. And this uh, affects degradation of the, the AV receptor. So you can see here in the Alex mutant, we have a higher level of the P4 protein compared to the to the to the to the wild type. So and um this so it's the same again so I'm not going to go further we have always more P4 compared to the wild type in the Alex Mita. So uh this is due to the Alex one mutation we could find I mean, we, we performed several experiments that indicated that the Alex mutation is affecting directly the interaction with the AV receptor. For example, a yeast to hybrid, if you, if you use the, a version, uh, an Alex version that contains this point mutation, the, the glycine to, to alanine mutation, so we lose the interaction. And also in vivo, you, this is what you can see here. All these dots is, this, is the normal situation in wild type cells where there is interaction within the two proteins. But if we use the, the mutant version of Alex, we lose most of the interaction. Here is quantified. No? This is the number of dots per field. So just a few dots compared to the, the wild type. So the Alex mutation is, is, is affecting the interaction between these two proteins. And uh, this is going to, 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 to demonstrate that this depends on, on the activity of Alex on the AV receptors, these AV responses, altered AV responses. So we, uh, uh, generated is a mutant, it's a pentuple mutant for AV receptors. So five AV receptors are affected. You can see here they are pretty insensitive to AVA. And um, when we, and this is the situation in Alex, they are very sensitive to AVA. And when we cross these lines and we generated the sextuple mutant, five for AVA receptors and one for Alex, we uh, have the situation as in the pentuple. So the phenotype of the Alex mutant depends on the on the on the AV receptors. This is done in plants, but also can be observed at the stomata closure level. Here again, I will just show data for the for the uh, infrared imaging of foliar temperature. So this is Alex, Alex, very hot, as you can see, compared to the Columbia wild type. But if we combine it with the pentuple mutant, we lose this this effect of the Alex mutation. Now the pentuple mutant is insensitive to AVA. The stomata are, are very open, and there is a lot of transpiration, and also there is a lot of heat dissipation. That's why you see that they are cool, no? And in the in the sex to permitter, let's say, so we get the phenotype of, of the ABA receptors mutation. So they are acting downstream of of Alex. So this would be the model uh, for this part of the vesicle trafficking. This is the wild type situation. There is internalization of the AV receptors uh, in endo endosomes, then internalization uh, at the when these endosomes ma uh, get mature. So there is internalization into intraluminal vesicles, and upon fusion of the multivesicular body with the vacuole, there is release of these um, intraluminal vesicles within the lumen of the vacuole for degradation. The problem in Alex, there is no good recognition of the AV receptors. The AV receptors are not going to be internalized properly, so they remain free in the cytosol or close to the membrane, and there is a higher perception of AVA, and that's why Alex mutants are hypersensitive to, to AVA. So in that way, so uh, Alex would be controlling the closure of the stomata, uh, um, depending on the water availability. So under um, uh, high uh, levels of uh, water uh, uh, availability. So we have this open stomata and there is transpiration and there is a, a, a nice uh, gas exchange for also CO2 assim assimilation for photosynthesis. But upon trough conditions, there's going to be an increase of ABA in different cell types, but also in wart cells. This is going to be perceived by AVA receptors that trigger closure of the stomata. But at some point, we need to, I mean, 
when, when water uh, availability is optimal again, we need to desensitize the system. And this is going to be mediated by Alex and the late endosome route to the, the multivesicular body the trafficking pathway. So in that way, what we are going to try to is to do, what the, the plan is going to try to do is to, to degrade the AV receptors to impair or to reduce AV signaling to revert the situation to the open stomata situation. So according to this model, what we have found, and we believe that this could be a very interesting uh, biotechnological tool, is uh, that Alex mutants are really, really tolerant to draft because of this closure of the stomata, this constitutive uh, closure of the stomata due to, to hypersensitivity to ABA upon a draft, for example, for 20 days, you can see our plants really survive nicely compared to the, to the controls. And uh, this could be a very uh, interesting uh, way or mechanisms to modulate closure of stomata by controlling the activity of alix or the, or, the, or the function of alix right in the stomata to keep them closed under uh, drought stress conditions. So just to summarize, um, I have shown you uh, different approaches that uh, aim to control overall uh, ABA perception and signaling uh, in a way that allows control of uh, many different uh, transcriptomic, but also physiological responses. As I said, this is a very complex response, so it's important to control the, the central or the key regulators of the pathway, in this case, the, the AV receptors, both by controlling the levels of these AV receptors by overexpression, their activity using um, ABA agonists that specifically activate uh, certain AV receptors or engineer AV receptors, to control the uh, stability of AV receptors by the canonical ubiquitin pathway or by the vesicle trafficking pathway to regulate the stomatal closure and to uh, avoid water loss. And finally, so the, the idea, I mean, I'm not going to, this is the future, the future in which you will participate. The idea is to, this is um, the step, uh, step further, no? how to manipulate at the epigenetic level, all this ABA or ABA independent signaling pathway that underlies trough responses in, in plants to regulate or to improve the trough tolerance and, and at different uh, stages of the plant, no? from seed germination, seed, seed establishment, the flowering stages, and, and, and all reproductive stages. No? So, and this would be everything. So thank you very much.